Welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show, the show that every single day celebrates the amazing people of this great state who are working so hard to make it interesting and wonderful and great to live, work, and play in. And listen, I won't give you any big speeches today because a lot of what we're going to do today will uh, sort of unfold during the conversation. So I've been really looking forward to today's uh, discussion. It's been, been, a, been a little bit on hold waiting for him to get back from Europe, but uh, we're going to spend some time with Robert St. John, my old friend. And the restaurant tour chef, Super Talk columnist now, Super Talk columnist, and uh, author, and uh, just jack of all trades. How you doing, Robert? Good morning, Ricky. How are you, buddy? It's good to see you too, man. It's good to see you. Hey, listen, um, we got a lot to to catch up on, and uh, one of the major things that I wrote about, in fact, just uh, yesterday morning, was simply that your story of sobriety that you and I have really not gotten into very deeply is one that is incredibly inspiring, especially when you think about food and wine pairings and tours all over Europe that involve wine pairing. And I think you know you're a great example for people to say. You know what? You know, am I drinking too much? And if I am, maybe I should take a pause and think about it. And there's a lot to learn from your story. We're going to get into that in just a second. Um, uh, our one of you know one of the many authors that you and I enjoy, Cormac McCarthy, is one of them. We used to say that he was the greatest living author in America. No longer can we say he's living, unfortunately. But uh, sad to see his passing, isn't it? Yeah, it really was, man. The guy. Um, you know, I write, uh, It's I don't make a living off of it, but it's a substantial part of what I do. And I i don't even, you know, venture into the literary realm at all. I just do a lot of, you know, nonfiction and travel and food and that kind of thing. But but I still write. And and there, there are few writers that really I'm just humbled when I read. I'm like, how does this guy communicate through the spoke through the written word like that rick bragg's another one yeah that, rick bragg really, no, really yeah, no question me. they yeah. just they're just pulling from um from a different place uh of inspiration and uh Corrant mccarthy man was just it was very masculine prose you know yeah. but the stories were great and his imagination was 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 great and he just he had such a um uh, such a grasp and command of uh, the written word. That's a big Yeah, loss. he rarely gave interviews. Uh, I shared one with you this morning that came from just six months ago. He died at the age of 89. This is obviously probably, his, I would assume, his last uh, interview. He's only done two or three in his entire life. He, it's interesting, in the conversation he did with the uh, with uh, Oprah Winfrey, he actually said, she asked a question, does it matter that millions of people are reading your books? And he says, you know, he's, he's pleased by it, but, you know, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> he yeah. was, he was, he, he, it was interesting because he was really focused on, he was really focused on trying to achieve some type of perfection in his writing. He was yeah. always trying to achieve this higher goal. And what was interesting, she asked him at one point, she said, do you, um, do you know where you're going? And he says, no, I don't. I just trust where it's coming from. Yeah. And that the great writers, that's the way they operate. It's so interesting to hear that, though, isn't it? Yeah, I believe that 100%. And uh, you, you, you hear a lot of interviews with great writers that, you know, it, the story starts with a premise and then it just takes its own life and it flows through them into the end of the typewriter, a keyboard. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I've, there, there's this great image of Ernest Hemingway, and I've read everything that he's written. Uh, down in uh, Cuba, and he's standing at the typewriter. This is during a very difficult time of his life. Drinking, he drank too much the whole time he lived. But um, but he stood at the typewriter for hours and hours and hours and never wrote a word, <laughs> waiting for whatever that was to yeah. come up. Uh, a lot of the great writers think that 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 is for sure. But we could go on and on about that. I mean, I got right here on my on my. On my desk, I've got a Hemingway novel. I've got uh, another Hemingway novel, uh, Faulkner. Um, interesting that Faulkner's uh, publisher at one point was Cormac McCarthy's publisher. So, yeah. you know, the world is small when you really get to it, which is a point I want to make to you, incidentally. Um, you were writing for the Sun-Herald when I was the publisher of the Sun-Herald, right. and I've watched your evolution of writing 
over over many years now. And now that you've added this Europe as your second home, uh, I think one of the one of the uh, there are so many great uh, uh, things that that Ernest Hemingway has written. But some of his best writing actually happened when he lived in Paris in the 1920s. But you've got all these inspirations that are affecting you now. I want to encourage you to write fiction. I, I want to encourage you to sit down and let it flow and see what happens because you've had so many experiences now, Robert. You you may be missing your calling. Well, well, I don't know about that, but I've got um, I've got a uh, an entire story that I've outlined uh, that's been there for about ten years that I've just got to got to get around to it, man. I've I've got a bunch of irons in the fire, but no, I'd love I'd love to write fiction, and I I really didn't start writing until I was almost forty years old. Um, I had a little penchant for it uh, in high school. I was fairly good at it, at least according to my teachers. And uh, then I got kind of single-minded, focused on the restaurant business, and um, didn't. I mean, it was a labor for me to write a letter to someone there towards the end in the in the newspaper uh, here, local newspaper in Hattiesburg. Started asking me to write a column, and I, I said no. You know, and they they kept coming back, kept coming back, and finally I agreed, and it was really bad early on. I mean, yeah, some people probably think it's still really bad, but. It was it was I cringe reading back because I wasn't writing with uh, with my own voice uh, early on, um, uh, and it wasn't really until you you mentioned Europe. It wasn't until I took that long trip uh, with my wife and uh, two kids back in 2011, and I had probably been writing uh, weekly, and I was in 30 some newspapers at that time. Got up on the wire a lot. Um, but it, it took me about 12 years to really find my voice and it was on that trip and really, you know, because you're, you're kind of, uh, you're in the trenches and you're, you know, you're in, uh, really rough conditions. And, and I just wrote how I felt and what I knew. And I wasn't thinking about Louis Grisard or David Sedaris or, you know, anybody else. I was just, I was me and. And the work flowed easily, and I, I think I found my voice. So really, you know, even though I was probably 39 when I started writing, you know, if you look at it, most people were maybe 16 when they started. So, you know, it took me 12 years, which which would have been a 28-year-old, but I was, you know, 52 or whatever. Yeah. So. But, but, you know, I, I, I get coming it, back man. to Cormac McCarthy, if you look back when he – some of his westerns, what he did to immerse himself. In fact, he would – in one case, he actually learned Spanish before he wrote a book. But the way he immersed himself and all these different experiences and how it played in to his writing. Um, you have all these different experiences now. You have this, this, uh, this perspective – that creates so many potential storylines for you that would that could be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I'll um, you know I'll, I'll I'll look into fiction eventually. I've I've just got to, you know. I actually when COVID hit, I said, all right, this now I'm going to write this novel. I've got time. I'm going to get up in the morning every morning, and I'm gonna I'm gonna write a thousand words. Which my column, the column I've been writing, you you referenced. Uh, yeah. I've been writing that for however many, 23, 24 years. I write a thousand or more words a week. I've never missed a week. It's probably 1.2 million words in print. So I mean, I can pump out a thousand words fairly quickly. And so I thought this is going to be easy. And then, you know, restaurant stuff got in the way, and I got in, involved with a independent restaurant coalition trying to save the industry and doing all that stuff. So. You know, it just yeah. one of these days I'm going to commit to. I have to write in the morning. I, I'm, yeah. I'm toast after lunch. I, I, there's no creative uh, juices flowing after lunch for me. And the great writers are monomaniacs on a mission. That's for sure. And you, you know, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what what you end up doing as it relates to that because you've got a you've got a talent. I've seen it. I've watched it evolve, and I'm thrilled actually that you're now uh, your column is now running with Super Talk Mississippi News. Uh, you know, Thank the, you for the, that. You're the one that yeah. uh, made that happen, Ricky. Thank you. Well, that's that's good, man. But here's the thing: Super Talk Mississippi News is distributed to 51 radio stations across the state through Supertalk.fm. You can get the news there, or you can get the app, or 
you can watch, you know, have access on foot on social media, but we have Robert's voice in the Super Talk News family. It's, I'm just thrilled to have it. That's for sure. Um, hey, listen, uh, your your European tours have been amazing, but when you look at your European work and your love of Italy, and now your growing love of Spain and and other parts of uh, of Europe. When you look at that and you understand that there was a point in your life where you were literally almost collapsed as a human being because of your lack of sobriety Mm -hmm. and the fact that you're going on these tours with all these people who enjoy wine and drinking and pairing up food and wine and all this other stuff, it's amazing to me that you're able to pull it off. So when we come back on the other side, I want to talk about that your your road to sobriety, how you maintain it. I have, I have a few things I want to share about things I've read recently about drinking on weekends. People think that that's okay, but when you've been drinking on weekends every single weekend for the past 30 years, yeah. you probably have a drinking problem. So let's talk a little bit about that, and we'll we'll continue the conversation with Robert St. John when we come back. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show. We're visiting with my f- friend Robert St. John, who is a restaurateur. He's a columnist. He's really a, an entrepreneur and jack of all trades. He really got a very successful business now, taking tours of people uh, to uh, to Europe. And he's fallen in love with Italy. He's fallen in love with Spain. He's been all over Europe with his family. And well, listen, man, when I went to, uh, you and I have talked about this to some extent, but when my wife and I joined my son in Spain, and then he came over to visit us when we were in uh, Croatia, um, Croatia is a lot like Italy where, you know, you, you, the, the, the bread is so unique. Uh, the wine is so unique. The olive oil is so unique. And those things sort of come together. To think that you take all that in, and you don't drink, and you haven't drank for a long time. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing to me, and it's a great inspiration to others, to be quite honest with you, Robert. And we live in a drinking culture today, sadly. And some people can do it occasionally and regularly and not have a problem. And some people, they have a big-time problem. And um, you had a big-time problem. I Talk did. about that. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was... Um... You know, I was probably 14 when I had my first beer. That was a pretty hard case. From about five years later, you know, I was sticking needles in my arms because I couldn't get the cocaine in my system fast enough through my nasal passages. So I, I escalated pretty quickly. Um, and by the time I was 21, uh, I was in a rehab center. Uh, that was 1983. And... Um, you know, I really, my, my earliest memory, if I'd like to go back all the way back to where I, my first memory, I'm, I'm about five or six years old. I'm in the bed. Um, I can hear my mom or my parents or whoever it was out there. There was a cocktail party going on. People were drinking, very romantic, you know, with the ice tinkling in the glasses and laughter. And I just knew that's how you had fun. That's the way you have fun. And, and so I ended up at a rehab center in May of uh, 1983, and I'm like, um, you know, what do you do if you, if you don't drink? How do you have fun? You know, and uh, so I had no concept of that, but um, uh, I had left a swath of destruction uh, behind me at that point, and, uh, you know, my life was uh, in uh, just a wreck, and I was, you know, I was an alcoholic and a drug addict, and uh, ended up in a halfway house in Omaha, Nebraska, and and it was a, a bunch of guys. I was 21, and it was a bunch of guys in their early 20s, and uh, it was it was run by the Catholic Church. It's called St. Raphael's in Omaha, Nebraska, and it was in an old funeral home. And uh, all these guys in their early 20s lived there. Well, they had to interview me before I got. So I had a one-way ticket to Omaha. If, if they didn't accept me, then I was going to be out on the streets in Omaha. So I, I got through the interview, and it was on a Friday in August of, of 83. And uh, I remember asking the guy, hey, man, you know, I've been in rehab for nine weeks. Um uh, you know, what, what's going, y'all going out tonight? And they said, yeah, we're going out. And I went, oh, cool. You know, what are we doing? And they said, we're going skating. And I just went, oh, 
Oh, man. This is exactly what I thought sobriety would be like. I'm 21 years old. You know, I've been living in bars and clubs and, and, and uh, you know, uh, having fun. But really, really, the fun had been over a long time by the time I got uh, to rehab. But but I didn't want to stay in that funeral home by myself uh, at night. And so I went with them and I went skating. Um, here's the deal. Um, I had fun. Uh, I haven't been skating since. Um, and, but something happened to me on a, on a skating rink in Omaha, Nebraska in 1983. And it, it was just the realization that it's not necessarily what I'm doing but it's who I'm with and how I feel in here when I'm doing it. And it's the first time I ever thought, well, maybe I could live life without alcohol and drugs and maybe I could have fun. And here's the deal, man. I hadn't missed a thing. All of these, I, I, well, I missed, you know, DUIs and, and getting fired from jobs. That's what I've missed. But, but, you know, life has been, some people can drink heavily and be successful at it. Some people are. I'm wired differently, and people like me uh, process alcohol differently in the brain. And the thing is, once once a person becomes an alcoholic, there's no turning back. It's happened. There's no going back. You you hear the the saying, you, "We're like men who have lost their legs. You never grow new ones." So that's the way. There's no turning back. And and so the the deal is, you either work on some type of program some type of spiritual program or step program or whatever works for you. And, um, and that, and that's what I've done. You know, I don't spend any time lamenting the fact that I am a recovering alcoholic and recovering drug addict at all. I mean, some people have psoriasis, some people have diabetes, some people have cancer. I have alcoholism, you know, people with psoriasis, rub a cream on it. People with diabetes take insulin. People with cancer have to have chemo or, or uh, you know, radiation treatments or whatever. You know, I'm an alcoholic. I, I work a 12-step program um, and uh, I have a spiritual program. I'm, I have a tight relationship with, uh, you know, God and, and uh, you know, I, I, that program allows me to prioritize my life in a healthy manner because left to Robert, I don't prioritize my life in a healthy manner. I'm left to Robert. My number one on the list is Robert. My number two is Robert. My number three is Robert. My number four, I'm the top 10. But when I'm practicing spiritual principles and the things I've learned in, in these other programs, um, then I prioritize, you know, God and, and my sobriety first, my family second, my friends third, my my work life fourth, and maybe maybe Robert comes in fifth there. And that's not a natural thing for me to do. But, you know, the thing is, you just, you know, I just, life life is good if I just don't drink. And that's the thing. And, um I haven't done it perfectly at all, man. I've I've made a, a mistake, but nobody grades you on sobriety. You know, the only perfect thing you can do is not drink. And yeah. so, so far since eighty three, May of eighty three, that's that's the only thing I've done perfectly. Well, listen, what's interesting, Robert? Robbie D'Angelo is on my show regularly. You know, Robbie and mm -hmm. Robbie has you know, a real inspiration in terms of getting your mind right and your physical right and getting those two connected so you can reach you know, your, your goals in your life and reach your maximum potential. And he and I talk about it a lot. Just drinking a little bit, if you do it regularly, it has a, a negative effect on your body. There's just really no you know, question that the science is, is pretty hard on that. I had a, I had a bout of, um, of atrial fibrillation about a year ago that came as a result. We're pretty sure it came as a result of the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the COVID shot because I'd had no issues before in my heart. I'm very healthy. And uh, what, but what I learned during that process is the relationship between your heart and drinking. <laughs> and so I actually, you know, I would drink wine from time to time. I, I, I don't like hard liquor. I'll drink a beer when I'm out by the pool or something. But, you know, you wouldn't define me as a, as a, as a big drinker at all. But even, even me stopping it completely, I was amazed, actually, at how... 
it just it, it changed a lot. Um, what what I what I what I what I find myself doing too often, probably too often, is watching others who are drinking when I'm not drinking. And I'm thinking, gosh, they have to. The only way they can enjoy themselves is to drink, and I'm not. I'm not drinking, and I'm having a blast. I'm. I'm actually enjoying the grandkids more than I ever did before, and all of that. How do do you find yourself in a situation where you see someone who's actually having <clears throat> indulging too much, where you say, gosh, you know. You know, let me share my story with you. Do you do you do that, or do you just keep it to yourself? I never. Uh, you know, if if somebody really has. Um, a drinking problem or a drug problem, you know, it's, they're going to, they, they need to get to the point of where they, they want help. Yeah. They, you know, nothing in the world uh, that I'm going to say unsolicited is going to come through. The The best thing I can do is what I do is share. When you ask me, I'm, I am, I am free and wide open to talk about how my life was changed and how how great it is today. I was 21 years old and I, I had resigned myself that I wasn't going to make it to 30. You yeah, know? and I was okay with that. The truth is, I probably wouldn't have made 25 the way I was going. And and so, you know, I I just talk about me and I talk about you know where I was. And I, you know, I had been evicted from a ratty trailer park and was a loving grandmother shy of living under a bridge. I mean, that's where I was with a major drug addiction, alcohol problem. And, and, and today I'm going to lead them and I'm going to talk about, you know, financial worldly, um, material things. I mean, I'm talking about the gifts that I've been given that I, that I appreciate today, at least are the spiritual things and the relational things. Yeah. It's, it's the people you know, that are, that are around me, uh, that I surround myself with. And it's the experience. That's what we leave. We leave the world with the experiences shared, you know, and, and relationships and, and the things we've done to help other people. And so that's, that's really kind of the space I'm in today. That's a, that's a great space to be in. Uh, we'll close this part of the conversation and then we're going to talk about what's going on in Robert's life these days, because there's always a long list of stuff underway but we'll continue after this break with robert st john we'll see you after this i'm watching uh, robert's head bob as he listens to that sort of rock blues music that introduces the ricky matthews show now and i my, my, my head bog, bobs a lot too when i when i listen to that but i've got robert st john's the uh, restaurant tour entrepreneur writer and just kind of all around the renaissance guy somebody i really enjoy spending time with and we were talking about his sobriety when we went to the break and um i, I get what you were saying that, that you know I I, I I i can't agree more and this is what the experts say as well that if you see someone who's having difficulties, the last thing you need to do is press yourself upon them and try to influence them because they're they're just gonna they're just gonna resist that. But but you, but I love the fact that when you're a, when someone recognizes they've got an issue, they're not exactly sure how they're gonna get through it. That you're open to them to uh, provide advice should they ask you. And you know that's a, that's a great friend. That's what a great friend does. Well. Hundred percent. You know, anybody reaches out to me, I'll, I'm happy to sit down and share my story. But you know, the sobriety is a program of attraction and not promotion. Yeah, so. yeah, I think that's a great way to say. It. Hey, one other, one other quick thing. When I see you sitting at one of your many tables in Spain, or when the same thing is true for for Italy with with groups that you that you have the opportunity to help kind of enjoy their experiences in Europe. And they're, they're sitting around the table, and there's this wonderful wine, and it's flowing, and you're sitting, and you're you're taking a picture of the group, and you're sort of the the center of the attention at the table. Um, do you ever wonder what does that wine taste like? You know, I uh, here's the thing: I, I don't I don't really think about it that much. I just know it doesn't work for me, and um, I'm I mean I own a bar. I own an inventory <laughs> of probably 3,000 bottles of wine, over 750 labels that I've never tasted ever. But uh, it just doesn't work for me. Um, if if I started, I would, this is what I know. If I started drinking that wine, 
then all of that's going to be gone. It's going to be a matter of alcoholism is a progressive disease. And even though I stopped 40 years ago, and I say I didn't believe this at first when when they told me early on, they said it's progressive. And you it doesn't matter when you stop. When you start back, you pick up just like you've been going all along. And I thought, they're just telling me that to scare me. And I'm going to tell you, over 40 years, I've seen that happen to so many people who get into recovery, and they'll have 12 years of sobriety or something. They go back out there, and they'll come in after six months, and they they look. I mean, it's 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 rough. So I know if I pick up today and, and start drinking, you know, I'm just not one. You're talking about you can have a beer by the pool or a glass of wine or something. I'm like, I, when I hear that, I'm like, why, why? I don't understand that at all. If I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have a case of beer by the pool. <laughs> you know, one, one's too many, and a thousand is never enough. And wow. it's just, and some yeah. people, some people have it that way, and that's that's me. But yeah. um, so I, I never even really think about it. So I, yeah. you know, every once in a while I have a fleeting thought. Yeah, I've been nice to. Have, when I when I had a fine dining restaurant to to know what wine pairings would taste like and everything, but you know, I I hadn't missed anything. I, what what a, I, what I a wonderful inspiration! Past. What a wonderful inspiration is. You know, you and I have you had, you've had we've had this conversation many times, but as you get ready, I, particularly we had a long conversation about El Rayo, your Tex uh, Max restaurant, and the number the amount of traveling you did to get that get that started, the, your yep. Italian restaurant in Jackson. Um, but you know, you immerse yourself, you really do. And uh, the, the bakery process that you've been going through has been fascinating. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we're opening a bakery. I've, I've wanted to open a bakery for a long time. Um, Martha Foose, uh, is a, a great pastry chef uh, from the Delta. Her husband, Donald Bender is an amazing baker. And um, they, uh, she had worked for Nancy Silverton out in Los Angeles, probably the best baker in the country. Uh, they had worked all over in New Orleans for Susan Spicer at a lot of places. They opened Bottle Tree Bakery in Oxford. Uh, then Fred Carl hired them at Viking in Greenwood. They opened Mockingbird Bakery. And when, when Viking sold, um, you know, the new company just did away with all the hospitality kind of things. And so she started writing cookbooks, won a James Beard Award. Um, and he took different jobs. And and so ever since then, I'm like, you know, come down here, guys. Let's open a bakery. And and it took me six years uh, to talk him into it. And uh, they they finally, they're here. Uh, they're, they're over there right now uh, at, at Loblolly Bakery. On 33rd and Hardy Street, uh, cook, we're cooking croissants today. We're doing tests. It's all testing uh, right now. Uh, we, we did a lot of sourdough bread yesterday. So uh, we're, we're two or three weeks away uh, from opening this, this dream bakery I've had for a long time. Real deal French-inspired uh, bakery with with all sorts of great stuff. I'm I'm really excited about it. I'm a morning guy and I'm a breakfast guy. And uh, you know we have a we have a breakfast place here called the Midtowner, where we do m breakfast and then we do meet and three at lunch. And about two blocks from there is where the bakery is. We're all in Midtown Hattiesburg, and um, except for Enzo, the Italian restaurant you spoke of. So we're we're getting close. We're we're getting there. Uh, we had some supply chain issues. It's kind of crazy these days. Uh, we're trying to get an oven from Portland, Oregon. It took about three or four months, but but I'm I'm fired up. So is there an outflow of your business case that will push some of these pastries into your restaurants? Oh, absolutely. We'll be baking hamburger buns for Ed's Burger Joint. We'll be baking French bread for Crescent City Grill. Uh, we'll be making granola. For the Midtowner, we'll be making uh, the loaf bread, sweet, white, sourdough for the Midtowner, um, pies, different pies for the for the Midtowner. And then we'll sell all of that in the bakery as well. Hey, listen, I admire, talk, speaking of Enzo's, which was inspired by a chef that you got, became friends with in Italy. Uh, great story, wonderful connection. I was, in, I was really impressed by the... The you know having open that opening that restaurant in the midst of the pandemic and all the the issues you had the opening issues and how forthcoming you were about the issues that you faced, well, and um, and the work that you've done to to make it right, 
Um, it's been a painful process, though, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. We, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't anybody that had eaten there knew the the issues we had. You know, it was my twenty third or twenty fourth restaurant opening, and uh, it was the third one I had opened during COVID. All had all had issues, but but the difference in that opening is that we took over another Italian restaurant and they closed one day and we took over the next day and uh, yeah. hiring in Jackson, Mississippi in non COVID times is hard in that area. After COVID it's even more brutal. And so I thought it would be best I did. Let's just keep everybody that was there before. Uh, and so we shut down. We we took over the next day. I paid everybody, you know, for two weeks while we were closed and, and revamping. And and we opened, and there were just greater challenges that even though that was my, I can't remember, 23rd or 24th opening, um, we'd I'd always open with my people. Like, I, I opened the first restaurant in 1987. I hired four managers, and, and we've never hired a manager since. We just... Just promote and, and people so they know our system, they know our methods, they know the way we run things. Here, we took on a whole thing. And when you take on people, which is great, you also take on culture and you take on somebody else's culture. And there were challenges that I'll just be honest with you, I wasn't equipped to deal with right off the bat. And, and it, it was a learning curve. And it, it took, really it took us about six months. At six months in that restaurant, we were really where we should have been at six weeks. Yeah, the opening of a restaurant is tough. It doesn't matter how many people uh, have been working in the industry. It doesn't matter what. It's all new, and you know, depending on per restaurant. Uh, but but we're we're at a base. We got to a baseline about a month ago, where I really started feeling good. We we cleaned house in a lot of areas, got new new blood in, and and people buying into the mission and making this stuff right. And so, yeah, it was chat, but you know, I'm open, I'm open pretty much about everything. I'm an open book. I mean, it's no, I'm not trying to manufacture some image of, of me that, you know, you can't live up to that. So, I mean, if we screw up, I'll admit it, you know, but if you ate there during that period, odds were, you know, probably 25% of the time, you know, we were dropping the ball in some form or fashion. I What's interesting about, now. about the process you went through to open that restaurant uh, uh, compared to the due diligence that went into El Rayo, for example, or yeah. the due diligence that's going into the bakery. I mean, this hey, you've been posting about the bakery for months. Yeah. This has been a, a long, diligent process. Yeah, and you're yeah. still not re quite ready to open, and then to do what you did with uh, Enzo's and and Jackson, you know, it's just uh, you know, look, 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 entrepreneurship's about investigating, learning from failure, and moving forward. We, I think everyone knows from your reputation what to ultimately expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. um, I hope so, but um, you know, you just El Rio actually was was in some ways. T tougher because it was like 10 or 11 months after COVID. And, and so we, we opened that restaurant still needing to hire 25 people. So wow. we, ran, yeah. we ran really short. The industry's feels like it's back now, but we, you know, we had two and a half years there that were brutal. Hey, when we come back with uh, Robert St. John, we'll talk about Midtown Green Park, which just recently had a green, uh, groundbreaking, um, a couple other things, uh, you know, the, the, the efforts that they have in their, in their feeding Mississippians that are less fortunate. That's an incredible story in and of itself. But we'll continue after this break. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show. I have my friend Robert St. John, someone I've admired for many, many years, many, many years. I knew him before Katrina, but after Katrina, you know, we actually we saw each other a bunch during the Governor's Commission work. I was always impressed that he would drive down to participate, and I was leading the tourism recovery effort for the Governor's Commission, and it was an amazing time in our lives to watch all those people work together to help us get out of the mess we were in, and Robert was right there with us. It was Pretty impressive to see him. Okay, so look, let's just kind of go the, down the rest of this, like uh, shotgun, I mean, uh, rifle style. Um, you had uh, Mid Midtown Park grand opening uh, last week. Tell me about that. Yeah, so that was the groundbreaking. Um, Hattiesburg, uh, we formed uh, about five years ago 
something called the Midtown Merchants Association. Uh, Midtown Hattiesburg covers uh, from Highway 49 to Interstate 59 and that strip of Hardy Street um, that's really the heart of, of Hattiesburg. You've got not only the three biggest industries in town, but the three biggest in the region with Forest General Hospital, University of Southern Mississippi, Hattiesburg Clinic, which is one of the largest privately owned clinics in the country. All our restaurants, I've kind of planted our flag in Midtown Hattiesburg. Um, I grew up four blocks from right now, where I am right now. I currently live about eight blocks, you know, from where I am now. So, um, uh, we formed that to take care of the interests of the businesses and uh, neighbors in this area. And Hattiesburg has 19 parks. Every one of them is east of Highway 49. Uh, there was none here. You got like a third of the tax base uh, and 25% of the population in this area. We didn't have a park. There are 19 in other parts of town. So I, I got on a mission and it's like, we need a park. And uh, we found four and a half acres uh, right in the right in the heart of Midtown Hattiesburg, and we got some grant money. Uh, we're we're building a, a, an amazing park with a great walking track. It's got a band shell. Uh, it's going to have Hattiesburg's only all inclusive playground, a pavilion, um, all of that kind of thing. So yeah, we had the groundbreaking of that. I think it was last week, and so yeah. hopefully by February, uh, we'll be open there. It's going to be great. I think that's exciting. Uh, you uh, you continue to to do things. With extra table obviously is a huge deal. That's uh, your brainchild. We've done a number of shows about it. You got the longest day coming up as it relates to the Alzheimer's Association. What do you want to say about that? Yeah, yeah, the longest time. My brother and I are co-chairs of the Alzheimer's Association in Mississippi. Um, our grandmother uh, died of Alzheimer's. Our mother uh, is in dementia right now. She's suffering from it. And uh, so it's something that's near and dear uh, to my heart. Yeah, the longest day of the year is one of the big across the country, uh, which is the summer solstice, which happens June 21st. That's the longest day. And all our restaurants are given uh, 10% of our sales to uh, go to help uh, find, a, find a cure. So um, I'm sure there are restaurants on the coast that are doing the same thing. So I encourage everybody uh, to look around and look up uh, uh, week um, June June 21st for the longest day. Hey, there there are other things we can talk about, but listen, in the short time we have left, man, super regionals were just in Hattiesburg. I love the the Applebee's buzz. And <laughs> we don't have an Applebee's. I loved. I'll, I'll be interested to see how many views you had, but that response to you had. We don't have an Applebee's, but we have a. That was a great response. Well, thanks. We, uh, as soon as I heard about that, you know, for those that don't know, uh, some Tennessee, University of Tennessee was a little upset. They didn't host the regional and their fans were kind of dogging on Hattiesburg. And one guy, obviously with no self-awareness said, you know, why are we going to have, they don't even have an Applebee's. And so, you know, I thought that was funny. And, and so I made a, a video that we, we don't have an Applebee's, but we do have this and we have that. And, and so, um, Hopefully, they came to town and supported the the local independent, uh, privately owned, independently owned restaurants in town. I hate that they're the ones going to Omaha, but uh, we were we were close. We had a lot of rain delays, and and you know it was it was not a good deal. But we we sure were happy to have it again. And the Southern Miss once again made it fun for us, and once again, Hattiesburg was on a national stage. It was awesome. And you, when you think about 64 years of baseball at Southern Miss and only four head coaches, man, that's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. that's hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah, and and Scott Berry is uh, man, but the winningest coach. He had those four games that got him four games in a row that got him to this super that we hosted. So I wish we could have sent him out uh, from Omaha instead of from Hattiesburg, but uh, he will be missed. And uh, we we wish him all the best in his retirement. Uh, there's no question. Hey, listen, we, people said when we joined the Sun Belt that – the competition was going to get brutal and Southern Miss was going to have a difficult time. Look what we did in basketball. Look what we did in baseball. Look what women's sports have done. And then now we've got something to look forward to on the, on the football side. So man, right. we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Will, Will Hall is going to build something here. We need to give him time. He's going to build something. He definitely is. Hey, listen, uh, my friend, we should get together more often. It's been a pleasure to catch up with you. 
Thanks, Ricky. It's always great to see you. You bet. This has been uh, Robert St. John. And listen, if you know somebody has got a drinking problem or you may have one yourself, um, listen to the conversation I just had with Robert about sobriety. They, you're, you can find extraordinary happiness in sobriety. Look look at the conversations I've had with Todd Trenchard, how many times he went uh, for help and he finally found his sobriety and has been in sobriety for over 20 years now. There's so many great stories. Don't ever give up with someone who uh, who's tried and failed and tried and failed. And it may take them 30 times. Everyone has hope and opportunity and uh, look to Robert's story as a way to give you some, at least something to think about. So have a great day and thank you, Robert. I appreciate you, my friend. Bye guys. You, you bet. We'll see you. We'll see you tomorrow.